When a plane crashes, for investigators, amongst the most important things to locate are the airplane's black boxes, often coated in bright orange. There are typically two recorders that are of note, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder, both of which can reveal key information about an accident flight. In the case of Lauda Air Flight 4, the disaster rendered the flight data recorder completely destroyed and any data unsalvageable. These boxes are built to withstand an immense amount of force and pressure as they are built to withstand the forces of a plane crash. What the loss of the flight data recorder tells us about the Lauda crash was that whatever happened here was very violent. We're going to break down the timeline of events which led to disaster and uncover the mystery that took the lives of over 200 people that night. In 1979, motorsporting and Formula One legend Nicky Lauda founded an airline bearing his family name. Lauda had had a successful career in motorsports to say the least. Following a particularly bad accident in 1976, where he suffered severe burns and came close to death, he pressed on in the world of racing, even returning to the racetracks just weeks after his accident. He would take a step back from racing in the late 1970s, and it was around this time that Nicky Lauda would set his sights on the aviation industry, founding Lauda Air. Lauda Air operated with just a small fleet at the time, consisting of Boeing 767 aircraft based out of Vienna, Austria. Nicky Lauda was not only the owner of the airline, his already well-documented resilience and confidence would seemingly know no bounds, as he would take the control wheel as one of the airline's pilots. Having achieved a commercial pilot's license and type rating to fly the 767, he would occasionally act as captain on Lauda flights, putting himself amongst those who keep his company running. On May 26, 1991, the Boeing 767 registered as Oscar Echo Lima Alpha Victor was making an overnight trip between Hong Kong and Vienna with a stopover in Bangkok. The first leg of the journey was performed uneventfully. Once leaving Bangkok's Don Muang Airport, the plane would fly overnight to Vienna with 223 passengers and crew on board flying as Flight 004. Flight 4 left Bangkok at just after 11 p.m. local time. The pilots following their programmed routing into the flight computer took the aircraft north of Bangkok over the Thailand countryside. The pilots themselves that night were 48-year-old Captain Thomas Welch. An American, he was a pilot of nearly 12,000 flight hours. He had an extensive record of flying various types of Boeing planes over the years, including the 727, 757, and now 767. His co-pilot and first officer that evening was 41-year-old Austrian Joseph Thurner. A highly experienced and competent pilot in his own right, he had accumulated around 6,500 flight hours by the time of the disaster. The plane they were flying was delivered to Lauda less than two years prior in October of 1989. This particular plane was given the name of Mozart after the famous Austrian composer. The Boeing 767 was powered by two Pratt & Whitney 4060 engines. Though the right side, number 2 engine, had been on the aircraft since it rolled off the Boeing production line in Seattle, the left side, number 1 engine, was replaced in September 1989, shortly before its delivery to Lauda. In the months preceding the Flight 4 disaster, Pilots began to notice issues with this particular engine installed on this plane. According to the maintenance log, the engine had been repaired 13 times. These repairs mainly pertained to replacing and making corrective adjustments to the valves and actuators which work the engine's reverse thrust mechanisms. The most recent of these repairs occurred just the day before the accident, when a reverse thrust locking actuator was replaced on May 25th. Apparently, Lauda Air had followed all the recommended repair and maintenance procedures set out by Boeing, and the plane, with its engine, was allowed to continue its regular service. It's necessary to refresh our memory as to what reverse thrust actually does on a plane. The term is pretty self-explanatory itself. It redirects airflow by shifting propulsion in the opposite direction. 
Reverse thrust is primarily used for slowing down on a runway once landing. On some planes, reverse thrust can have more practical applications, such as independently pushing back from a parking position, though this is not really the case with the Boeing 767. The design of reverse thrust has even changed over the years. Some older Boeing and even McDonnell Douglas planes used a bucket type mechanism to redirect air towards the front of the plane. As technology progressed, a more compact internal design would be the feature of the Pratt & Whitney 767 engines. Lauda Flight 4 had been in the air for just five minutes. Everything seemed to indicate a routine departure from Bangkok. An indication in the cockpit brought the pilot's attention to an advisory warning about the reverse thrust. For a short time, the crew discussed what to do about the warning and even consulted the quick reference handbook. The QRH details all warnings the plane can give and any appropriate actions that a pilot should take. Upon further evaluation, they determined that no action was required. The plane continued its climb for roughly another 10 minutes. In that time, things were quiet. There was a small conversation about adjusting the rudder trim, but this was irrelevant to what happened. Just 15 minutes after takeoff, as the plane was climbing high above the sparsely populated hilly jungle north of Bangkok, the plane's left number one engine reverse thrust deployed. The pilots did quickly identify this as indicated in the cockpit voice recorder transcript. For the reverse thrust of an engine to be activated, two checks need to be met. A valve which controls the hydraulic fluid called the hydraulic isolation valve needed to shift the engine components to the reverse position needs to be opened. Another valve called a directional control valve also needs to be opened or the engine will not go into reverse. It should be practically impossible for these two valves to open and allowing an engine to enter reverse thrust in flight. In the case of Lauda Flight 4, that is exactly what happened to the left number one engine. The engine that had its reverse thrust mechanisms repaired and in maintenance several times failed the pilots that night and the reverse thrust deployed. But this is only a surface level analysis and doesn't really explain why to an appropriate degree. It is believed, according to the investigation, that electrical wiring shorted, sending wrong signals to the engine instigating the opening of the reverse thrust quoting the accident report. The investigation of the accident disclosed that certain hot short conditions involving the electrical system could potentially command the directional control valve to move to the deploy position in conjunction with an auto restore command for a maximum of one second, which would cause the thrust reverses to move. But the other question remained, why was this so dangerous? Boeing themselves had conducted tests that would seem to indicate that flight crews of the 767 should be able to control and safely land their planes in this exact scenario. Boeing's own testing of the 767 would be criticized as being inadequate as the testing conditions did not match that of a plane at high altitude. The properties of the air the plane flies through and the aerodynamics of the plane itself changes as a plane ascends higher. Boeing did not conduct in-flight reverse thrust testing at high altitude. When such testing was conducted with adequate conditions after the accident, it was concluded that deployment of reverse thrust in flight could be extremely dangerous, and that flight simulators had not been appropriately programmed with the correct flight physics to mimic this. When the reverse thrust deployed on Flight 4 that evening, it only occurred on the left engine. In this moment, the plane's aerodynamic balance shifted as suddenly the left side began pushing forward creating an intense turning motion to the left. Unfortunately that night, the pilots had mere seconds to assess the situation and take corrective measures. The following seconds in the cockpit could best be described as a mixture of confusion, desperation, and disorientation. According to the voice recording transcript, several warnings, sirens, and caution alarms began to start and stop. The pilots themselves did not say much in their final recorded moments, as the recording ends less than 30 seconds after the first officer noticed the reverse thrust had been deployed. Though the voice recording stopped at 11.31 and 5 seconds in the evening precisely, this was not exactly when the plane crashed. 
The plane was already breaking apart in the moments prior to this. It was just now the connection between the recorder and the cockpit had been severed. It is likely that the pilots would have desperately tried to correct and arrest the plane. This resulted in the separation of the tail fin and right elevator, rendering the plane hopelessly uncontrollable beyond this point. The violent nature and forces exerted on the plane tore it apart in the air as it plummeted to the ground. To say for those on board, it would have been a terrifying final moments of their lives would be an understatement. The rear section of the fuselage separated, quite possibly ejecting passengers at this moment. The wreckage and eyewitness accounts would indicate that shortly before the main structure of the plane hit the ground, the right wing broke away from the fuselage. The plane at this point was traveling at a speed greater than the speed of sound. Following the detaching of the wing, the rest of the plane erupted into flames and began disintegrating. The wreckage eventually crashed into the Thai countryside, killing all 223 people on board. Upon hearing about the crash, the airline owner, Nicky Lauda, placed himself into the investigation, personally flying out to Thailand to assist those investigating. It was determined that the reverse thrust was pretty much the causing factor in the accident. But this didn't sit right with some, as tests did show that reverse thrust deployment in flight should be recoverable. Given the short amount of time the pilots had, there was no way to feasibly save the plane once it had become uncontrollable. The accident was a wake-up call for the industry. In-flight reverse thrust deployment is no longer considered to be a somewhat benign issue. Flight training was overhauled and the airline industry moved on. However, in-flight reverse thrust deployment has claimed lives since Lauda 4. On October 31st, 1996, a TAM Airlines Fokker 100 crashed just moments after takeoff from Sao Paulo in Brazil. An uncommanded reverse thrust deployment took the lives of 99 people in that accident. We'll have a video on this disaster sometime soon. In November 2002, Luxair Flight 9642 crashed near Luxembourg Airport. Though a completely different plane, reverse thrust played an interesting role in that disaster. To learn more, consider watching the video we already have on this accident. For Nicky Lauda, he saw it was himself to be held accountable for investigating the disaster, and thus eventually resigned following the investigation, Austrian Airlines acquiring the airline in 1999. The Lauda brand would go through multiple variations over the years. It is currently owned by Ryanair. This version of the Lauda airline now serves primarily in Malta. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. I was thrilled with how this one turned out. I actually think this is one of my personal favorite videos on the channel yet. Anyway, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like and subscribe as there will be a new video every Saturday. If you want to, you can follow my personal Twitter account and you can find the link to that in the description down below. A big thank you to my patrons over on Patreon as always. The support shown on there is greatly appreciated and I can't thank them enough. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, thank you so much. A big thanks to a new joiner this week, Void Star Chan, for the amazing pledge on the Patreon. Thank you so much. If you want to have your name featured here at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon and also get early access to all new videos 48 hours before they go out publicly on YouTube. Link to that will be in the pinned comment below. So that is it for me this week. I hope you have a great day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.